to start out. This will be the last session, I guess, for the, for today. Uh, and so hopefully to wake you all up, I'll start out with a, with one joke. How do you do? Or what is the difference between a used car salesman and a software salesman? All right, you know the answer, right? A used car salesman generally knows how to drive and generally knows when he's lying. Right? All right, and 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 so the the, the need, excuse me, the need to communicate uh, between the operational architects and the system architects is huge, and that's why I'm in this business. Ten years ago, the Defense Acquisition Guidebook was undergoing a review. I put in 59. Uh, comments saying you need to put MBSC in here, you need to put MBSC in here, you need to put MBSC in here, and I came back all rejected. We have no need to do MBSC. Things have gotten a lot better. Okay, so we're in pretty good shape. Also, about ten years ago, I called the chief engineer of some place, and he says, "You know what you are, Monty? You're a good idea fairy." So, anyway, good idea fairies can still have a little bit of success. So, uh, let's get on into the presentation now. Uh, so a couple of things we're trying to do. Let's see if I can get this down here to work. Hello. And do we hit the space bar? Lost the sound from you. I don't know why you clicked, but we lost the sound. Ah, okay. All right. So I've been on a warpath to to try to help uh, our project managers or product managers, uh, and more specifically, DoD move towards the digital enterprise. And so the pre presentation I want to share today is some of the lessons we learned uh, in the organization-wide rollout of MBSC across a program executive office, uh, some of the uh, extensions to the UAFML uh, standard that were necessary to support a PM, uh, and then I want to talk about the uh, application of missing engineering uh, to support uh, the PM's program. And so that's, uh, that's where we're trying to go today. Uh, everything needs context, and so in the context, if I can hit this button, come on. Honest, I hit the same button you did. I am talented today. Can I go here? Yeah. Okay, just right there. Okay. So everybody needs context. And so this is uh, uh, an example of a typical PEO organization. No one in particular, uh, but you've got about six product offices, and about 21 product managers, all right? Uh, and each one of these product managers uh, has different projects, and they're at different levels of maturity or different part in the life cycle. And so you can see I've got these various colors, and you can see uh, product manager A has this many and product manager B does everything. But when you put them all together and you sort them by which part of the life cycle phase they are, you can see I've just got a very few in the front end and then the blue there is uh, engineering and manufacturing development. That's when most of our system engineering takes place. As I get into production and deployment, operations and support, I don't have a lot of dollars to support system engineering. And so working within a PEO, this is kind of like herding cats because they don't have the dollars to do it. And so they're, guess what? They only do those things that are absolutely necessary. Uh, and so it's a challenge uh, at an enterprise level to roll out uh, to the entire enterprise. Uh, you got to have a phased approach. It's just like when we're changing copies of the software, we go from 19 to 20, or excuse me, 21, or to 22 in, in the magic draw that we use. Uh, it's, uh, we have to let them change when they're ready to change, right? if that makes sense, okay? Uh, and then contracts and resources keep us from moving faster. All right, we'd be there by now if, if, if contracts weren't in place that says you will use software A or you will use software B. Then the vendor comes along and we want to go to the next version and they say, ha ha, we need more money because you said by version A, right? So that's one of the challenges that we've learned. Uh, uh, one of the lessons we learned 
was uh, we, we looked at the INCOSI model-based capabilities matrix and user's guide, and we did an assessment of every one of those 21 PMs, and we found out that product offices cannot unilaterally achieve stage three, nor can they achieve stage four. So you can see the colors there. The blue is something that we thought they might be able to achieve. The yellow is something that somebody higher would need to be able to achieve, uh, to, to achieve. And then the purple is something that much higher in some cases are necessary, okay? So a PEO might not be big enough. All of Army not, might not be big enough, okay? Uh, and so you've got to understand is we're trying to move diligently with MOSA and all those various pieces. Uh, we've got this challenge that we don't control all the pieces parts. We don't control all of the moving parts. Product manager also has other challenges outside of system engineering. Uh, as he's looking at his total life cycle system management, he's got to be concerned about uh, uh, providing system availability, uh, process uh, uh, efficiencies. Uh, he's got to be able to do training. He's got to be able to do parts, uh, etc. And in the little inset, we show the process of how ICDs flow in. You get an ICD, then you get a CDD. We test it, and if it works, we go into uh, the, into the field with the first, first increment, right? Then we come and we do the second increment and we do the third increment. And so if a requirement doesn't quite come into play, uh, it becomes part of that next increment. Uh, and so that spiral development process uh, is something that we, we, uh, we have to deal with down at the PM and the PEO level. Our center of gravity, one of the lessons we learned was there are folks that want to use all these various standards and we teach these standards and we, you know, we at least teach how to spell them and what they are and what they do. Uh, but our center of gravity really within, uh, within a PEO is within SysML, UAF, and ODAF, okay? There are a lot of other tools. In fact, there are some tools or some of the standards that we try not to use because they're not the center of gravity, although there are reasons why you might use a VPMN in certain cases, okay, or an AADL but you use them for what they're best at. But what you don't do is you don't build the center of gravity around those tools because we need to be able to use what SysML brings to the table and what UAF uh, ML brings to the table uh, to do the analysis we wanna be able to do. And as we look at the system engineering, okay, come on, you can do it. Uh, my toolbox. Uh, when you look at the PM, I'm going to just kind of run through some of these, but as we begin to look at uh, uh, our, our acquisition toolbox, uh, the MBSC models that we build inform and are informed by the other tools that are out there. We have force-on-force -force simulations. We have few-on-few -few experiments with the Army and the Navy and the Air Force are doing. We can bring the model-based design tools forward. Uh, we can do a lot of what-if analysis up front with CAD, uh, with you know the various design elements, but at the same time we need to be able to uh, bring the analytical models into play on the other side. We've got performance analysis tool, hardware in the loop, software in the loop, integration, simulators, stimulators. The Army and the military has spent a lot of money on these simulations for years and years and years. What's new is the MBSC part. Okay, because we've been doing six offs forever in, in some of our anal analytical pieces, right? Uh, and then we have test. We need to be able to support test, uh, and it'll come into play. And then, of course, we have technology refresh. And so all of these things that we have to do are things we need to be able to do. We're very successful at doing, but they all need to be centered on that authoritative system representation, which is the MBSC model, right? Okay, so one of the places where we start is requirements, and one of the things uh, that we've learned is that the, the, the checks, here you see the, the, the different, this is a simplistic system engineering schema for JSITs. This won't, uh, this won't help everybody, not everybody will agree with me, but we see the CDD and the ACD, the ACDD, which is an abbreviated CDD, we have an ICD, and what I have a problem with my PMs is trying to explain to them that that document isn't the only set of requirements. I've also got con ops set of requirements. I've got uh, how to fight set of requirements. I've got uh, the op mode mission summary that says how hot is it going to be? How cold is it going to be? How far am I going to go? All of those things. I have directed requirements to come in. All right. And you see we put use cases in there because use cases is how we come up with our big rock 
operational tasks that we need to accomplish. Now we refine those by doing activity diagrams or uh, uh, sequence diagrams or state diagrams. Uh, but what we want to be able to do is take all of these sources of, of requirements and we need to get them into a spec and associated data that's going to help us. Again, don't have to have a shall statement to have a valid requirement. Our big issue at the PM is we've got to be able to test it, right? And so we've got to have test plans, we have to have test cases, we have to have evidence, we have to have all of those things that has to come out of this process. And then our vendor has the same thing with their systems, and their tests. And what we want to be able to do is take advantage of the satisfy and verify relationships. And when all this is packed up and it all works, we're ready to go to the field. Works really, really well. So as we're looking at requirements, there are three requirement types, and there's more requirements than this, but I just want to talk about three uh, as I go into uh, some of the, um, um, yeah, some of the extensions, all right? Uh, everybody talks about KPP, KSA, APA. There's others that use other uh, various uh, definitions, but in the JSIDs, uh, KPP is the key performance parameter that if my system doesn't do this, I don't field it. And so we pay a whole lot of attention to the KPP and not so much to the others. It's interesting, sometimes my users don't tell me if it's a KPP right now. I mean, there's some of those that uh, in JSIDs, we've always known the net ready KPP and things like that, but there are other performance parameters that we might not know are KPPs or KSAs, et cetera, right? And so one of the things we wanted to be able, from an extension perspective, is we wanted to be able to actually call them out uh, as a stereotype. And so we can see our requirements metadata here. Uh, you can see I've got KPP, I've got KSA, I've got APA. And as we were doing this extension, and we extend uh, from the extended requirement, okay, because we want to, it's an extension, it's not a customization, right? But there was data that we needed about that. For instance, we needed the doors ID, right? How many guys have to deal with doors? You know, so we need a doors ID tag to put that thing in, right? Uh, we need to know whether it's a, 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 a functional requirement versus a non-functional requirement. We need to know uh, the rationale. And we wanted to put it in the same element as the requirement because if you have a rationale and you have a requirement, if the requirement goes away, the rationale goes away, right? As we got through it and we were talking to our testers, they also wanted to say, well, where are we going to test it? And so we had to come up with some generic, venue one, venue two, venue three. Um, we had a, you know, we always have comments, okay, because everybody wanted comments. And then we put three more tags, tag one, tag two, tag three, because you can never have enough metadata about requirements. Right, so we, uh, we we did this as we it was looking at, it, and, and we took all of those things that uh, uh, that, that Incosi and, and the OMG has thought about requirement types uh, that have stereotypes like uh, uh, business requirement, etc. Made them tags because we didn't want to stack stereotypes. Okay, not sure that's the best way, but it's what we did because we wanted to add things like system assistance requirement because there are things that are different. I've got a system assistance requirement versus a individual system requirement, or I've got a weapon requirement versus a sensor requirement. And so uh, some of that metadata might be very, very useful. Uh, we also found that it was easier for us to, uh, let's say you had uh, two different types of requirements. Say it was a performance requirement and a directed requirement. Okay, so we put that uh, in there and, and we use that today and our, and our PMs are able to print any spec or any document directly from the model and they print the verification matrix at the same time. So we're never comparing pieces, right? Uh, so it really works for them. One of the pieces that we added was a document text artifact because a, a document text artifact shares the same thing. A paragraph and a requirement share three things, right? A number, a name, and text. Okay, so it was great. Background, document text artifact. So if it wasn't a shall statement, we just made it a document text artifact. Now we went through all of the CDD stuff, and I'm not going to, to bore you with the details of that, but we went through all of those and found every unique type of requirement that the user was going to give us and made sure we had a stereotype that matched that. And it worked pretty well. And so this is one of the extensions that we use, and it's one of them that we share and it's one that we advocate because it helps us as we're trying to, uh, as we're trying to uh, uh, manage the metadata about our requirements. Now here's an interesting fact. Uh, I've got at least two program offices where they extended my extension because they needed more metadata than I had, all right? So tag one, tag two, tag three wasn't enough. They needed more. Okay, I, 
I get it. And you want the PMs to be able to get the information that they want. Okay. I am so gentleman. Okay. And oh, by the way, one of the things they told us was what happens when the requirement changes? I need to know who made it. What was the gist of the requirement? Was it an add? Was it a subtract? Uh, who approved it? Because if Colonel so and so said, I approve this requirement, and he goes away, and Colonel so and so else comes in, who approved this? We need that metadata to be into our, into our model. And so, so, so we did that. It's probably not the best way to go. But, uh, but, but this metadata is something that we need to be able to, to manage. And, it, and, and I believe that there are some of these that may uh, have enough value to, to actually make them as part of the standard. So that's one of the extensions. Another extension that we did, uh, come on, I can do this. There we go. Want a number, almost everything, you know? And, and what some of the people were doing before we made an extension uh, that allowed us to number it was they would, uh, they would put the number and the name together in the name of the system. And all that made was it was uh, unable to, to sort by, by name, all right? And so we like to number things. We like the number to show up in our activity diagrams. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, and, and we want to be able to assign that uh, identifier as a way to what? Uh, Organize things in the containment tree, and I'll show you an example in just a minute. So, given that, now we're able to print. Uh, there's the spec. Uh, this is a little little demo spec that we do in in our little class, and you can see that the the metadata prints out at the same time, right? Uh, and then and then we also came up with a methodology to, uh, to to put together a PowerPoint presentation directly out of the model, and we used a identifiable element is a numbering tool to say what order I'd like them to come out. Work pretty good. So one more extension I want to talk about because I don't have a solution for it, but it's a quibble that my testers brought said, I need you to tell OMG that we've got a quibble about uh, the extensions. So here I have a C2 system uh, and there's a C2, a copy at battalion and there's a copy at brigade and there's a copy at division. Okay. And they're all part of that. Now, now this is how we teach them to do, do a, uh, an SV1, SV2. Uh, you can see the little diamond there and you can see what's being transmitted. That little transmitted thing is a test artifact, okay? Because we're gonna transmit this one and then we're gonna transmit that one, and we're gonna transmit this one. And, uh, and, and, and so here's, you know, we, we, we hijacked the, the, what was uh, the equivalent of SV6 and you can see the numbering uh, on the side here so I can put them in order. Okay, so I got test step one, test step two. The problem is that um, I can drill down. If I have a part in, in, uh, in SysML or if I have a part in, in UAFML, I can go down and get the parts part, okay? It's difficult and I haven't found a way to go find the higher information to drill up, right? Uh, so what organization was this particular C2 system at? Right? Where was he? What, what, what position? Because it makes a difference, right? And so the ability to, to you know, perhaps have an attribute in, in the parent that says, or, or into the child that says, and oh, by the way, this is the parent, you know? So if he has a part, then this guy ought to be, have, have, have some, something, right? Now you guys probably, you know, look out there and say, I've already solved that. I want to hear from you, okay? Because that's one of the issues that we've got, because we want to do this thing model based, define it once, use it many times, right? Uh, and without the ability to drill up and figure out if maybe I got three or four echelons I have to go up. He was in the division and he was in this particular area and he was, you know, so you can really get real, real busy with that kind of thing. So we wanna be able to do that. And this is where I think I've spent most of my time is trying to figure out that there's a miracle occurs, okay? Now, you might take the operational guys and put them on one side of that. You might take the system guys and put them on the other side of it. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's being able to fit in that crack and being able to communicate between the operational side and the system side uh, that's been kind of the work that I've been trying to do for the last 13 years. Uh, and it's one that we've got a lot of people in this room try to do the same thing, right? It's also my segue into the second part of my briefing, and I guess... I'm doing pretty good on time. All right, and that is to talk about uh, mission engineering because all of the things that our user wants to do, they think through a lot of stuff, right? 
Uh, and uh, there was a great organization called the Emerging Technologies Institute, and they made this recommendation to the Department of Defense in November of 2021. Uh, and this is what they said. They said, these are the challenges the DOD is, uh, they, they need to be able to have integration of data sufficient to answer things like, how do my systems that I have there now support near-term missions? What's the performance or cost impact? And how do the design decisions today impact system sustainment? Okay, so those are great things. And then they gave us this great chart and it talked about digital engineering maturity. And they happened to pick electronic systems and they then took the arrow and they said, uh, semiconductors, chips, boards, integrated assemblies, very, very high maturity. But when you get down to systems and down to missions, very, very low, right? I love that chart because what it does is it allows me to if I can hit the button here, this is great. It, it suggests that the largest opportunity we have to mature the overall digital engineering process is in the area of mission engineering. Okay, and so you've heard about it you, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, what's it mean to us? You've got requirements models that come from our user. I uh, believe, you know, we've got CDDs, we've got ONS, JUONS. Uh, we believe that the strategic layer, layer is where you need to do Drivers, challenges, opportunities, got to do that full element. Uh, and they do this, the user does this, but right now it's not documented very well. In UAF ML 1.2, we've got the ability to do that. And we need to do that, and we need to convince our users we need to do that. Then we go down to the operational layer, service slash resource layer, and then you get down to the design specifics. We don't want to design the system at the top level, and the uh, but that, 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 that layer, that, that, that operational, uh, that key missionary layer is, is the strategic and the operational. However, wouldn't it be nice if we did it this way? We did the strategic layer first, and then the operational the second, and then the requirements, okay? Because they've already thought through the other two and they've documented them, and I now also have the pieces of information I need to push that into my use cases and all those other pieces that I'm going to need to build the system that they really want. Okay? So that's kind of a, a place that I, so I'm going to show you a chart that, uh, that you've seen before. I love it that when you go last in one of these things, everything you would, didn't want to have to go through, someone else has already explained. So we're going to leave alone the one side and we're going to talk about the other side. Okay? Yes, we have scenarios. Yes, we have vignettes. And those have for years been laid out. Okay, DOD has always had vignettes. They've always had scenarios, but they might do it in a force on force model. They might do it on a tabletop. Okay, uh, in, in, in the lower level engineering models, and you can see as I go down my pyramid, as I go from uh, campaign analysis down to combat utility, uh, which is kind of a force effectiveness kind of thing, and I go down to the engineering models, uh, it's important to maintain the context of the scenario. Now, you're not going to get the context of the scenario all the way down there, but it's important to maintain it. Why did you do it this way? Why did you set up the test this way? Because what happened in the higher level scenario. And so you have force on force uh, that people use to answer easy questions. You know, I want to add 10 kilometers to my radar. What a great force on force question. I don't need a system engineering model to tell me that. All right. Problem is, a lot of people like to measure my, with a micrometer and chop with an axe. Okay. And if you're going to measure with a micrometer, then on top of the net. But, but if it's an effects model, and a, force, a good force on force model is an effects model, because when they ask the question, how fast is this going to be? I don't know. Why don't you put down a, a number, and, and we'll say it takes 30 seconds, and then when I turn on this new capability, it'll now only take 15. I may be orders of magnitude off on just how different the numbers are. But if I put it in the model first, I can play with that all day long, right? And so an effects model is great for that kind of thing, okay? Now on the other side is we have the system model, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the system engineering, the MBSE system model. Okay, you see we have the same kind of thing. Just like in the m and side, we've got the capabilities, we've got the strategy, we've got the CONOPS, right? Our mission threads in the operational model, right? Our test threads for the operational tests come out of there. The, 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 the logical models, you know, 
we're able to go down to the, the, these various mission models and mission threads, uh, but we're able to put all of this stuff together to begin into the question, okay? A great, uh, a great uh, 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 carpenter has many tools, and we want to be able to do the same thing. So you put the two together. <clears throat> and I've had people say, I'd do this differently if I were you, Monty. And they haven't come up with a solution, so I'm going to keep dripping it until you guys come up with a solution, okay? Uh, when you look at the comparison between the two, the authoritative system representation is on the left because the people that wrote the code for the simulations on the right are the only ones that know what's really happening, right? And so we put that kind of thing together, right? In uh, digital twins, you're going to have most of your digital, digital twins down at that digital level, okay? You might have some at the individual uh, component level, but you're not going to have one at the force on force level, and you're certainly not going to want to have it at the strategic level. But what you want to be able to do is you want to use those digital threads, and I love what they're doing with that, to, to the digital twins to support digital thread, to achieve the operational thread, and to meet the goals of the organization. Okay, yes ma'am. Two minutes. Okay. Last chart I want to show, and then I'll just kind of glide over the other two. So, mission, mission thread, mission thread. All right, three things go in a mission thread. This is what I teach people. Number one, the, the tasks that you need to do. How do I get those? I get those in my use cases. Two, uh, what is the information I need to do those tasks? And three, what's the logic? If you want the engineers to figure out the logic, help yourself, okay? But in an operational model, I need logic to say, when am I going to do A? When am I going to do B? Because I may not know how to drive and I may not know if I'm lying, right? Okay. So you see UAFML supports acquisition. You can see I've got my use case right there in the middle of the operational model. You can look at that. But let me go to the uh, recommendations. You have, I think we're going the right direction. Uh, we need to encourage folk to use UAFML and SysML. Okay, it's not an either or proposition. Number two, currently we're able to access all system L functionality with UAFML. I can do parametrics, I can do Monte Carlo with DODAP described artifacts. It's wonderful. We need to consider requirement metadata. And lastly, uh, need to consider drill up. Okay, if we could do that, that would be awesome. That's all I've got. Hey, Monty, once again, great presentation. Why did you say in the beginning, in relation to the MBCM, why most POs couldn't achieve level three or level four? Well, because they, they do not have the wherewithal, okay? If I went back up to my briefing chart, and I don't know if I'm able to do that, but the idea of picking the language, okay? You don't want the PM picking the language when you got 21 different product offices. We need to say, here's the organization, this is the one we're going to use. Okay, so they can only get so far because at some point in time they need help from higher, whether it be direction or whether it be, you know, concepts. I believe that until we get the entire enterprise together, for instance, both my user and my, my, my builder, my, my con I think until we get that enterprise and we're able to do a zero trust environment to where we can share models and all these various tools together, if we continue to try to do it down here like little caterpillars, each one having their own little, little, little leg, I think we're going to not be able to achieve what we want to do. So we need something that's like centrally implemented and decentrally controlled, okay? Because you're never going to have... You're always going to have to give control to the PM because he's got uh, Title 10. He has responsibility. But if we could bring these pieces together, we've got the whole smart people that they know how to do X, Y, and Z, right? I don't have that at a PEO level, okay? And that which I have rotates for different reasons. And you guys have the same problems, right? Did that, did that help? One more question. Yeah. I'm kind of curious of your insight into actual digital twins um, from just a, a declaration or certification of such in the DOD. Do you know of any? Well, we have uh, what we call the missile on stick. Okay. So our missile on the stick acts just like another missile. Okay. Except it's on a stick and, and we feed the same information as though there was a what? 
a, 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 a motor and canards and all of that kind of thing. And so we're able to go in and do a lot of acceptance with my missile on a stick without having to do what? Go out and do everything else. We do a lot of command and control. In the air defense, we own all of the shooters, all the sensors, all the C2. And so we have virtual machines that are doing some of this stuff because we haven't built the actual system that's going to do it. So that's an example of a digital twin. Certification, it's only as good or as, as robust uh, or as uh, useful as it is accurate, that it's a good digital twin. Is it? Okay, good. All right, thank you.